morning, everybody. So good to see all of you here today. What an incredible morning that we can come together and worship our great God. Why don't we all stand together? Let's stand. And I just want to share with you a few verses from Psalm 66. It says here from verse 5. Come and see what God has done. His awesome deeds for mankind. He turned the sea into dry land. They passed through the waters on foot. Come, let us rejoice in Him. He rules forever by His power. His eye watch the nations. Let not the rebellious rise up against Him. For you, God, tested us. You refined us like silver. You brought us into prison and laid burdens on our backs. You let people ride over the heads. We went through fire and water, but you brought us to a place of abundance. Isn't that incredible? You know, the word says, come and see. But this morning, it's not just come and see what God has done. Come and hear what God has done. And we get to hear that at this morning. It is so incredible. That's the God that we worship. Amen. Why don't we just uh, commit this time to the Lord in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much, Lord, because you continue to do great things in our midst that amazes us. And Father, I just pray that may our thoughts and hearts be drawn to your power, to your majesty, to your sovereignty this morning, Lord God. And we want to declare who you are in this place because you continue to do great things in our midst. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. feet he has done great things see what our savior has done see how his love overcomes he has done great things he has done great things oh hero of heaven you conquered the grave you free every captive and break every chain, oh God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive, oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high, oh God, you have done great things. Through every storm, you'll be faithful forevermore. You have done great things, and I know you will do it again. For oh, your promise is yes and amen. You will do great things, God, you do great things. Good. 
the grave You free every captive and break every chain, oh God You have done great things We dance in your freedom, awake and alive Oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high, oh God You have done great things You have done great things in our lives, in our families, within ourselves. We lift you up, Lord God. We praise you, Father. We praise you, Lord, this morning. Thank you so much, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Let's continue to worship the Lord this morning. Come on. Lift up your voice. above the battle the undefeated Savior stands with me the fighter for the weary the Lamb of God the lion hearted King oh, the glory of the Father, the power of the undefeated name, the king of every kingdom, the champion of heaven overcame over every broken heart. Hope is rising through the dark. stands with me, the fighter for the weary, the Lamb of God, the Lion-hearted King, over every broken heart, hope is rising through the dark.
God, we pray this morning for the continued inbreaking of your kingdom here in and amongst us. How grateful we are to know that you are the king and that you are still at work, still changing people's lives, still bringing your reign of peace, life, and how desperately we want to be a part of it, Jesus. And how desperately we need you to continue to break the kingdom into our lives. Yes, Lord. That more and more you might lead us into a fullness of life. Jesus. And yet each and every one of us have people in our lives that we deeply love and care for who do not know you and do not know that peace, that life. And so right now, every face, every name that comes to mind, we just lift those up before you. And we continue to pray, Jesus, that you would draw them to yourself by your Spirit. Humbly, Jesus, we pray that you would use us as your hands and feet in that circumstance in their lives. And we pray, Jesus, that we would be ambassadors and we would shine. Because of you in us, not just by what we do, but because of who we are. Now this we pray for. We'd love to see our community, our city changed in the name of Jesus. Mm. Yes, Lord. Flourishing in the life that you have for it. And so we continue to pray, Jesus, humbly, but also incredibly boldly, because we know it's your heart. We pray powerfully in the name of Jesus, would you come? This we ask for in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Before you take a seat, why don't you turn around to the people in and around your vicinity and just welcome them this morning. Fantastic. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to church. A special welcome to any visitors that we have with us as well. We hope that you guys are blessed by our service this morning. It's time for our kids to head off to MPK. May you guys have an amazing morning as you have a look at what it means to be known by God. That's what you're looking at this morning, known by God. May you get a sense of the value and the worth that He places on each and every one of you. We love kids in this place. So may you be blessed this morning. For everybody else, our encouragement to you is stick around after the service. The cafe is open before the 8.30 service and then in between the 8.30 and 10.30 services. There's also coffee available in the foyer and all of that is just an excuse for us to connect with one another and be family and just spend some time together as family. So please don't rush off after the service. If you are new and you want to chat to someone about connecting in here at Mount Pleasant Baptist Church at a deeper level, then please make your way to the Connect Point after the service. There is some beautiful people who would love to help you do just that. Well, why don't we pray before we take some time to give together this morning. So would you bow your heads to me? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for who you are. And our declaration is that you are a truly good God a good Father who's faithful and kind, gracious and just. Your mercies are new every single day. And yet at the same time, your Spirit relentlessly seeks to lead us into life, continually chipping away at us, molding us into the image of Jesus. And we're grateful for that, grateful for who you are, that you truly are good. And so we declare your faithfulness, we declare your goodness as one people here this morning. Father, we come together and we pray, and we pray in particular for our families, kids who just returned to school. So we pray a blessing upon our families in the midst of the busyness of the term that's just started. Father, we pray that in the midst of all of that, everything going on in their lives, in the midst of that business, the continu- continual pressures of family life. Father, I pray that they would discover and guard healthy rhythms of grace. Times where they can connect with you as a family. Times when they can spend wonderful quality time together as a family. May you be at the center of everything they do and may you bless them because of that. We've got a number of people as well, unwell as well, Lord, and so we want to uphold them and so... Father, for those who are sick, for those who are battling illness and disease, 
Lord Jesus, we pray for healing. And that's not an empty prayer. We come in the power of the name of Jesus and we pray for healing. We pray that you would restore them, Father, and sustain them in the midst of what is a really difficult journey. Father, for those who are recovering from surgery, we pray also, Lord, that you would guard them and protect them, Father. We pray against any infection or any complications post-surgery. Father, we pray once again that you would strengthen them. Their recovery process would be smooth, speedy, and that we might see them here once again, Father, because you've had your hand upon them, watched over them in the midst of their recovery. And so we pray over those, Father, recovering from surgery. We think of Helen Burbeck, Max Wishaw, and Ian Riggs. In particular, Lord, we just lift them up before you. We continue to pray, Father, for us as a people as well, that we would embrace the idea of people of peace, but that we would have eyes to see those in and around us who are hungry, who are searching, who are longing for the light. Father, we pray that you would give us a heart, a deep love for those around us and a deep love for those who do not yet know you. And we pray also along with that, the courage to step out in faith and to be who you've called us to be. May we truly be your ambassadors, messengers of hope. More and more, Father, we pray that you would sow that into us as a people. Last but certainly not least, Lord, we pray for our offering this morning. We see the needs in our community and we give because we want to meet those needs, but we also give, Father, as an act of love and worship. This is not something that we have to do. This is something that we love to do, an absolute privilege for us to participate in the things of the kingdom. And so we pray, Jesus, that you would bless all that is given this morning. And may you be honoured because it is an act of love and worship. This we pray for in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Why don't we give together? You'll see the green buckets on the end of the aisles. It's pretty simple. Just pass it along. And the ushers will collect them on the end of the aisle. Let's give together. Good morning, everybody. It's lovely to see you. Uh, Thank you for your faithful giving. Just a a quick financial update for our church family. So uh, if you're visiting with us today, just just bear with us. This is kind of a little bit in-house. It doesn't really apply to you, but uh, you you can listen in on the inside of what's going on in our church. But as you know, the ministries of this church, including staff salaries, are funded by the generous offerings of you, the church family each week, and uh, we're very thankful for uh, faithful giving, and uh, certainly we we know that as a church we're extremely blessed here, and uh, certainly we're confident that the Lord will continue to provide all that is needed to fulfill His purposes here at Mount Pleasant, amen? Amen. However, having said that, uh, at the halfway mark of this calendar year, Uh, As you can see from that graph up there, we're about $85,000 below budget year to date. And um, look, we understand uh, absolutely that things are tight for households, interest rates going up and tough times for many people. And so um, here at the church as well, we've been doing all that we can to uh, reduce our costs as far as possible. But I just need to let you know that if our regular giving continues to be below budget for the second half of the year, then uh, we're going to need to take some more drastic measures, which uh, will involve cutting back on things like salaries. So as you can see, there's a bit of self-interest in this announcement uh, from me. Uh, Things like our missional giving. We don't want to do that. We don't want to pull back on those things. And um, so we're bringing this to you now so you can join us in praying about your regular giving for the second half of the year and uh, we'll continue to provide monthly updates to our giving through the the weekly communication that goes out, the weekly emails. In the meantime, if um, if you are part of our church family here, then um, please join us in just praying about our church finances. 
Um, pray about your giving and uh, pray for those who are sort of administering the finances at board level, at leadership level as well. We need God's wisdom in being good stewards of what God provides. And uh, we've certainly been here before, by the way, many times, many times over the years. And uh, time after time in my history here in this church and uh, even prior to that, we've seen God's wonderful provision. Uh, he's always provided all that we need. And um, we depend on him together, actually. We depend on him for all things. Um, one of the key verses of my life is Philippians 4.19. I've known it to be true. In my own experience, my God shall provide all your needs. It's a word the Lord gave me many years ago for my own personal life. My God shall provide your, all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. So we trust him. Uh, but um, let's, uh, let's come to him now. Let me lead you in prayer uh, for our financial situation. Father, first of all, this morning, I would just pray for those in our church family here, those present who would be sitting thinking, goodness, things are already so tight. It's just so difficult. Uh, Lord, um, the last thing I'd want is to place an extra burden on people for whom life is already as difficult as it can seem. But Lord, we just trust you together. We trust you personally for our financial needs. We trust you as our provider. And so we trust you collectively. And we thank you, Lord, that in so many times in the past when we've been in this exact situation, that in your faithfulness you have provided over and above what we need to do what you've called us to do. We pray for Gary Burford in his role as executive pastor. We pray for Aileen in her financial role. We bring the board before you as well. Lord, together would you give them, give us all, the wisdom that we need in the administration of the finance that you provide, that we might be wise stewards of all that you've given us. Once again, Lord, we, we trust you, we put our faith in you, and we look to you to provide, and we ask you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you for that. Uh, for our teenagers this morning, it's time now for you to head out to, uh, to Keystone. You can head off now out towards the back door and to the left if you've not already gone. Excellent. And uh, this morning we have um, an update uh, around our college ministry, Mount Pleasant College. So in a moment, uh, I'm going to invite Jake to come. Jake's our head of college, and I think Joel's going to come with him. But first of all, uh, let's roll that video. Thanks, Ed. Good morning. I'm Jake, the head of college. You may not have been aware of it, but yes, Mounties has a college born from a vision that Gray Maybury, our previous senior pastor, received from the Lord back in the 90s to use the creative arts as a vehicle to reach out into the community. So what do we do at Mount Pleasant College? To make it easier to understand, many of the things that happen during a church service, apart from the message being preached, we train in at our college. You need music, you need sound, you need live streaming, postings on social media afterwards, and graphically designing key events to be communicated. We are in a niche position that we are recognized as the only registered training organization in WA that specializes in the creative arts, delivering certificate three and four courses to mainly year 10 to year 13 students. This opens unique opportunities for students from all over the city and WA to come and study with us. Many of them are not Christian, have disabilities, mental health challenges, and doing it tough in the mainstream school environment. We have a team of passionate Christians who all feel called to be here, loving on these students and sharing our faith with them. As we became more and more aware of the missional opportunity to permeate society, we've become more and more intentional. As a team, we regularly pray together, we share God's stories, we encourage one another to have one-on-one -on -one conversations with students, and we've recently had Joel uh, Louis joining our team as a, as a chaplain for the college. We're super excited for the work that God is doing in and through our team, and in particular through Joel. Hi, my name is Joel. Before serving as chaplain here, I spent the last 20 years teaching in the area of creative arts at university. 
From experience, I found that young people who are drawn to the creative arts tend to be wired a little differently. They might see and experience the world in divergent ways compared with their peers, and sometimes we need different strategies to support them effectively. It's been amazing for me to witness firsthand how the instructors and college staff reflect Christ's love, from the way that they engage with students in the classroom to how they serve the students and their families at the start and end of each college day. Mount Pleasant College has a very broad range of students, some of whom come from Christian backgrounds, but the majority of students have yet to encounter Christ. We have high-performing and ambitious students who are driven to succeed in the creative industries, but also a number of individuals who have really struggled throughout their primary and high school years. But the common thread, as it is in the wider society, is that the transformative love of Jesus has the power to work wonders in their lives. The college staff, who are all passionate Christians, have seven hearts and support this mission in a variety of ways through their exceptional pastoral care and the individual attention and focus they provide to each student. Over the past several weeks, I've also been meeting with other students who've been grappling with some tough personal challenges. If it's relevant and appropriate, I might share a story about how I've grappled with a similar situation and talk about how faith in Jesus has transformed my own life and how his love has carried me through significant life challenges. A couple of weeks ago, there was a student experiencing acute psychological psychological distress. They arrived at college in tears. We created a safe space for them and spoke with them to try and understand the situation. And then Jake and I um, met with parents to try and provide strategies and options for them and the family. A week later, I caught up with that student and the difference in their disposition was like night and day. I truly believe that God had worked a miracle to turn their circumstances around 180 degrees. The student also remarked to me about how touched they were about being prayed over and that nobody had done something like that for them before. In term three, which will be on or around the time you're watching this video, we'll be running Alpha Youth for the first time at the college. Having spoken with a number of students, I know that they're keen to come along to learn more about life, the universe and God. Please keep the College Alpha in your prayers and ask for God to move in grace and power over the students in this course. As a team, we're really looking forward to see what God has in store for the college in 2024. We'll be looking to build on the pastoral case strategies from this year, as well as run a series of pre-alpha courses in Terms 1 and 2 to prepare the soil for running Alpha Youth again in Term 3 of 2024. I'd like to encourage you to pray for the college, that God will stir the hearts and minds of the parents and students that He wants to bring to His college next year, and for His Holy Spirit to continue to move in this place and transform the lives of students in powerful and tangible ways. Good morning, church. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, share with you, um, either through the, the video or what God put on our hearts. So this is Joel, our chaplain. Um, yes, absolutely. <laughs> we, uh, I'm sure you've seen through the video what an absolute blessing it is to, to the college and to the students as well. And um, I would just like to read for us from Mark 2. While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him. And his disciples, for there were many who followed him. When the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said to them, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. I don't know if you, uh, we don't talk a lot about this regularly, but, you know, our church's mission is to follow Jesus, to permeate society, and to transform lives. And that is exactly what we try to do through the power of the Holy Spirit at Mount Pleasant College. As a team, we're all dedicated Christians, as you've heard. We all follow Jesus. We bring in the lost into our building on a weekly basis. We pray for them. We love on them. And we trust God that he will transform their lives. And I just want to say thank you for all your prayers. Uh, we appreciate it. We feel supported by the church. And we're super excited because on Friday, we had 30 students that attended Alpha. You know, and, and it is just amazing. And you know, you know, you know, for those of you that attended Alpha or have invited someone to attend Alpha, you know, that's how Alpha works. It's not Alpha per se that actually 
draws people. It's the relationships that people build. And the Holy Spirit uses that um, relationships to actually invite people to, to join Alpha. And that's what happened at the college. We built relationships with the students, and then we invite them, and then they come. And um, I'm sure the lunch helped a bit as well. <laughs> but uh, I would just like to thank Joel for the work that he's been doing. Um, he's been fantastic, and uh, he's just so gifted in that space. And to the college team as well, um, that's just been fantastic. So thank you for your support, and... Um, and in particular for financial support as well, for those who donated to our DGR fund. I really appreciate that as well. And I'll uh, hand over to Jonathan. Incredible. Thank you. Let's just give Jake and Joel a big thank you this morning for the faithfulness and the love in serving the college. We have about over 140 students this year, so it's, that's a dramatic increase in our college. It's, it's fantastic and it's so exciting what God is doing. And I said, as I said to you earlier in the service when I opened it in Call to Worship, that we, that we just don't get to see what God's doing. We get to hear what God is doing and that is incredible. So why don't we just pray for the college and for Jake and Joel this morning. Let us pray. Our gracious and loving Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for inviting us to be part of what you are doing in our city and in this world. We thank you for our college, Lord. Thank you for allowing us to even uh, position ourselves to be doing this, uh, the college, Lord, that has a very specific niche, Lord, in our city. And we thank you for the response of parents and students who wants to come and learn from our college. We thank you for our team of tutors, loving, passionate about you. Father, we thank you for each one of them. May you bless them, Lord, as they engage and as they teach and share their knowledge and their expertise to the students. I pray, Lord God, that each student, as they come to our building, that they will have a sense of belonging and acceptance and an embrace that comes from you. And Lord, we thank you for the opportunity that you have opened for us to run Alpha at the college. Thank you for Joel and the team of volunteers. Thank you for the students that have responded. Father, we want to pray specifically, Lord, for this ministry. That you will reveal yourself to these students, Lord, each week as they learn more about you. As they learn more about their purpose. Father, I pray that may the Holy Spirit reveal himself to each one of them we ask for your protection lord god for all the students and lord we just pray lord god that uh, at the end of this alpha course lord that there will be a harvest of souls and people coming to know jesus and lord we pray for jake and the team that you will empower him that you'll anoint him that you will strengthen him give him extra measure of energy lord god as he provides oversight and leadership of our college. We thank you for this missional opportunity. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's give them a, one more. Well, thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. Wow, incredible. Let's all stand together as we continue to worship the Lord. And as I was reflecting on these next two songs that we're about to sing, it really kind of draw me to two scenarios. One was at the cross, which was a very public display of God's love and demonstration of His love when Jesus was crucified. And yet something very private was happening almost at the same time at the temple. And the gospel describes it like the curtain at the temple was stripped in half. And it's the kind of curtain that no human hands can just rip and tear. And yet the hand of God stripped it open. And what we see and know is that God is inviting us, that no longer just the high priest to come into this holy place, but we have all been invited into the very presence of God. Amen. And I think that's a beautiful thought. Let's keep that in mind as we worship.
before us and don't believe we sing the song of ages to the land your name is the highest your name is the greatest your name stands above them all over oh, all Your name stands above them all, and the angels cry, Holy, all creation cries, Holy, you are lifted high, Holy, Holy for. Most holy place 
And this morning we want to enter into that holy place. Spirit of Jesus, living within us, never to fail or forsake, unending promise, heaven inside us, whispers the sound of your name voices he who was and is to come is the one who lives in us the great I am Yahweh he who was and is to
Holy is the Lord. Worthy is the Lamb. Jesus Christ, the one who is the same yesterday, today and forever. Eternal, unchanging. And the one in whom we put our trust. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your presence with us. We thank you for our church family. We praise you, Lord, for every person who calls this place home, for the children in MPK, for the teenagers at, at Keystone, for the elderly folk, Lord, who are joining us online, for those who are gathered here this morning. We gather, Lord, as your people. We pray, Lord, you'd give us a, an increased hunger for you, a hunger for your word. Do a deeper work in us. Draw us deeper into yourself. And teach us this morning, Lord, more about what it means to walk in step with your spirit in those unforced rhythms of grace. Guide us and teach us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Thank you again to our team. And uh, yes, good morning. Uh, welcome to another installment of our series on spiritual rhythm. And uh, again, a welcome to those uh, joining us online from all over the place. It's great to have you with us. Today, um, our emphasis is on this idea of abiding. What does it mean to abide in Christ? So um, let me start with this first image. Uh, when it comes to swimming or bathing, whether it be in a pool or in the ocean, uh, there are different levels of commitment, aren't there? So if you're sitting on the edge of the pool with your feet dangling in the water, um, are you in the water or not? Well, not really, you're not really in the water. Um, your commitment's not that great. And likewise, if you're standing in the surf like this with your, just your feet in the water, you're not really in the water. Not fully, you sort of are, but not fully. Then by contrast, you get the person who dives headlong into a pool or uh, you know, those people that just run into the surf and just dive headlong into the surf. Uh, that person is fully in. Now, when it comes to the Christian faith, as you read the New Testament, you quickly discover that genuine faith is not something that you can half-heartedly dangle your feet in or skirt around the edges of. When it comes to the Christian faith, you are either in, fully in, or you are not in. And so on the day of judgment, there will be a clear delineation between those who are in and those who are not in. In other words, the Christian faith is a fully immersive experience, not something in which I dabble. In the letter to the Philippians, uh, probably one of my favorite books of the Bible, there's a phrase that Paul uses 18 times actually and it's this phrase, in Christ or in the Lord. Here's a little summary of those uses just from Philippians. We are saints in Christ. We are confident in Christ. We are called heavenward in Christ. We stand firm in Christ. We rejoice in him. We hope in him. We agree in him. We glory in him. We are found in him. We are guarded heart and mind in him. We have our needs met in him and we welcome others in him. Wow. It's almost as though that for, for Paul, everything he is and does and wants to be revolves around this idea of being in, being in Christ. Now, I don't know about you, but my challenge is that I then look at my own life and my faith and uh, you know, I'm not sure that I can honestly say I've arrived at that point. I love the, uh, the concept, I love the idea, I love the theory of it, but if I'm honest, much of my confidence and my rejoicing and my hope and my agreeableness and my efforts to stand firm, uh, my attempts to guard my heart and mind, much of that in reality is in something other than Christ. I agree in things going my way. I rejoice in my good health. I'm confident in my own ability. I, I manage my life. I hope in the strength of the local economy. 
I guard my heart and mind in the maintenance of carefully managed boundaries as I organise my own life. And the extent to which these things rest on something other than Christ is the extent to which they are precarious. And so my health could fail without warning. Some of you know a thing or two about that. Things often don't go my way or the way I expect. The economy is shaky. My boundaries shift beyond my control and foundations that seemed firm can quickly become unstable, can't they? And so we discover that life is fragile and too easily becomes precarious. And in the face of that instability, I find myself lapsing into the very thing that in Philippians, Paul wants to spare me from, and that is anxiety. I become anxious about everything where Paul says, don't be anxious about anything. And so, the deep and simple answer to all of life, the deep and simple answer to all of life, lies here in this phrase, in Christ. And in this understanding of what it means to abide in Christ, there's a spiritual rhythm of restfulness and peace that's only discovered through abiding in Christ. We have a simple reading this morning, it's fairly brief, just John 15, five to eight. And these are the words of Jesus who says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you're like a branch that's thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask for whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourself to be my disciples. According to Ephesians 2.8, We are saved by grace through faith. One of the great tenets of the Reformation. And so the idea, we understand that our salvation is a free gift from God and there's nothing we can do to earn it is a strongly accurate biblical truth, right? We're saved by grace through faith. But the idea that therefore we are to do nothing or that there is nothing for us to do is not accurate at all. We're not contributors towards our salvation, but in a very real sense, we are certainly active participators in it. And so the New Testament knows nothing of a faith that is inactive. It's only active faith that bears good fruit, fruit that lasts, and that good fruit is found only through our abiding in Christ or life in the Spirit, that involves alignment of my thoughts and my words and my actions with the heart of Jesus. And it's that alignment, that degree to which I'm living, remaining and abiding in Christ that produces fruit. The fruit of the Spirit, another fruit, fruit that lasts. So this morning I'm gonna just share with you three characteristics of a life lived abiding in Christ And uh, the first of those is what I've labelled as tenacious dependence. You know, uh, as a result of the fall, we all have a natural inclination to do what is not right. And so if you see a sign like this next sign that says wet paint, (laughs) keep off. It's a very simple instruction, isn't it? But immediately, something in your brain goes, well, that paint doesn't look wet. Maybe it's an old sign. Well, there's only one way to find out. Oh, no, it is wet after all. (laughs) Wet paint. And that fallenness in our nature, that wrestle, is still there after we come to Christ. So we point our compass at the true north of the cross of Jesus, if you like, 
But then if we're not tenacious in our dependence upon him, left to our own devices, we begin to drift away from that true north. There's a natural drift away towards things that are not right. We drift in ungodly directions. Uh, In the news this week was the story of uh, the Australian fisherman Tim Shaddock. I think we've got a picture of him there with his dog Bella. Not sure if you picked up this story, but they were picked up off the coast of Mexico after two months, two months if you don't mind, adrift in the Pacific Ocean. So they set sail from Mexico to French Polynesia in April, but then a few weeks into the journey, a bad storm destroyed their electronic navigation system. And so they'd, had, they'd set their course, but they lost their navigation system. And so uh, this guy and Bella the dog, they began to drift. And before they knew it, they were lost, actually. They were just adrift, lost at sea. And uh, very lucky, actually, to be spotted by a local helicopter. But it's a picture of what happens to so many people in life. See, not only do we have this natural tendency to drift off that center of Christ, but we also face various severe storms of life that threaten to throw us off course altogether. So you can be cruising along quite comfortably and faithfully in your walk with God, but then along comes a storm in the form of the death of a loved one or a serious health, like cancer diagnosis, or a relational breakdown, or some kind of crisis in your family or in your life, and then all of a sudden, your navigational system has been destroyed, and this is what you discover. Disappointment produces drift. And so people become disappointed in God, actually. And then they find that they just begin to drift. And life begins to drift off that that center of Jesus and the cross of Christ, and before you know it, you're completely adrift and lost at sea. See, what the storm reveals is the degree to which my faith is in Christ, which is an unshakable foundation, right? Unshakable. If I'm truly in Christ and my faith is truly in Christ, that is an unshakable foundation. It's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Eternally unshakable. Or I discover that actually my faith is in something else. My faith is in things going my way. My faith is in a favorable outcome to my prayer. Lord, you do this for me, then I'll trust in you. If you don't do this, well, I'm not sure if I can trust you anymore. Those are unstable shaky foundations that are quickly destroyed by a storm. And suddenly we find ourselves apart from Christ. And Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing. By contrast, Paul says, I can do all things in Christ who gives me strength. In Christ, I can face all sorts of hardships and challenges and storms and even bear fruit as a result of them. That's a miracle. And so I need to nurture this tenacious dependence upon him in all the seasons of life, the first key characteristic of a life lived abiding in Christ. The second is deep-rootedness. Tenacious dependence, deep rootedness. When Margie and I walk around by the river uh, near where we live, there's this one tree in particular that I reckon Margie comments on nearly every time and she'll say something like, oh, I love that tree, I, have, I just love it. Look, it's just beautiful. Uh, and it is, uh, well, I took a picture of it the other morning, uh, afternoon, late afternoon this was. Uh, there it is, planted right by the river in good healthy soil a clear example of deep rootedness that grows sturdy branches that bear fruit that lasts. You know, there are people in this church who are like this tree, and it's a thing of great beauty. 
These are people whose roots of faith go deep into Christ. They abide in him. They remain in him. They have remained in him over many, many years, even through some pretty severe storms in their own personal lives and in this church, by the way. These are people who are always here, rain, hail or shine. They rarely complain. They always have a word of encouragement. They're prayerful. They come early to help. They put up their hands to be on the menial, unglamorous rosters. They're always thankful for something, these people. This is one of the benefits of being a pastor in the same church for a long time is you get to see and know and love these people who are like this tree. Their roots go deep into the love of Christ. And here at Mount Pleasant, let me tell you, there are lots of them. Paul describes them well when he writes to the Colossians, if we can put that next scripture up, Ed. Uh, So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith, as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. My encouragement to you is to be one of these people, to be a person like that. In fact, let's do something quickly. Can I ask, if you've been here in this church, Mount Pleasant Baptist, for longer than I have, that means you were here pre-1996. Would you just stand where you are for just a moment? Pre-1996, where are you? Wow, look at them all. Just remain standing. I know you don't want to. Remain standing. But let me tell you, deep rootedness grows sturdy branches that bear fruit that lasts. (sighs) Remain standing. I probably haven't said this enough over the years, but thank you. Thank you for your faithfulness to God and to this church. Thank you for your tenacious dependence on Christ through the various storms that no doubt have rocked your boat and in some cases I know continue to rock your boat. But you are an inspiration and an encouragement. Thank you. Please be seated. <clears throat> Tenacious dependence, deep rootedness. The third characteristic of a life lived abiding in Christ is this it's diligent repentance. You know, one of those people who stood up was Ev Ingram. I love Ev. She, Ev, we work with Ev in the office. She is thankful. She is thankful every single day for something. Now, Ev's husband, Vern, was um, always very kind to me. We had a great friendship back in the days before he went to be with the Lord. And uh, amongst other things, we shared a love for silver birch trees, <laughs> of all things. Uh, in fact, um, here are the birches uh, at, in our front yard at home. This is kind of down the end of our front yard. Still beautiful, even, aren't they? Even in the sparseness of winter, they have a beauty about them. Well, Vern's garden was far more established than ours, but Vern used to lament with me at the way his silver birches would reach a certain, of, a certain level of maturity and then they would die mysteriously. And Vern's theory, which I've never discovered whether it was true or not, but Vern's theory was that over time their roots would hit a layer of salinity that would kill them. They'd sink their roots into something that wasn't actually helpful for them, which would then draw up those nutrients, or in this case the salt, which would kill the tree. Well, that theory got me thinking about a spiritual parallel. You know, as followers of Jesus, we're in Christ. Christ dwells in our hearts through faith, faith, and we are rooted and established in the love of Christ. That's the idea. Uh, That's uh, that beautiful verse in Ephesians 3, rooted and established in the love of Christ. So we need to be careful, don't we, in an ongoing way as we devote ourselves to abiding in Christ that we're not sinking any of our roots into anything harmful. And where we do recognise that harmful 
salinity creeping into our system and you'll feel it in your spirit. As you're in Christ, you're in Christ, but your roots go into something that's not Christ-like. And so you begin to draw something into your system, into your spirit that's not helpful. That can happen just very easily. Um, That's where diligent repentance is required. Let me give you an example from my own recent history that called for some diligent repentance. Uh, A few years ago, I realized that a a seemingly harmless habit was in danger of becoming harmful. I'd uh, returned from long service leave and uh, I'd sort of gotten into the habit of lying on the couch in the evening and scrolling mindlessly through Instagram reels. Anyone ever do that? Or, uh, no, no one, okay, I'm the only one. Yeah, clear, yeah. <laughs> sure. It's embarrassing. Some of you, who should have put your hands up, uh, <laughs> know how mindlessly addictive that can be, and generally there's nothing particularly harmful in the content. Uh, not a lot that, that's particularly redeeming either, I must say, in my case, lots of dogs and cats, you know, doing (laughs) funny things, Seinfeld bloopers, uh, people falling over, uh, you know, sort of the mindless things that amuse small minds like mine. (laughs) But here's what's happened, what happens, that's dangerous for men, I can't speak for women, dangerous for men, a reel comes up, and these things flick through reasonably quickly, they last often a few seconds each, A reel comes up with a woman in a bikini. Well, that's got you all quiet, hasn't it? (laughs) And if I pause on that reel, or I allow it to play a couple of times, you know, there are then uh, some powerful algorithms at work, not to mention spiritual forces, but those, even just those computer-generated algorithms go, Ah, you like that picture, do you? Let me show you some more pictures like that. It's absolutely how the system is designed. And so then, before you know it, the bikinis are getting smaller, the activities are getting a little more risque. I'm lying on my couch thinking, I'm not sure how I got here, (laughs) but I know that I shouldn't be here. And I know that if Margie would look over my shoulder at that moment, she'd definitely be saying, so uh, what are you looking at there, Nick? (laughs) Look, if you think pastors are somehow exempt from the temptations common to man, then think again. In fact, in some ways, we're at greater risk. James 3.1, those who preach and teach will be judged more harshly. I was in danger, actually, of allowing roots to sink into a layer of salinity that would be unhealthy. So I shared that with one of my accountability partners in my MP3, and he said, so what are you going to do about that? I said, well, if I delete Instagram off my phone, that'll probably work. So that's what I did. It's just such a simple thing, isn't it? But it's an example of diligent repentance. Turn away, repent, turn, just simply means to turn. Turn away from that which is unhelpful. And actually what I've discovered is life is better, actually, because I'm free from that time-wasting hamster wheel. Not suggesting that all social media is evil, by the way. A fair bit of it is, just quietly. (laughs) Repentance is a wonderful gift. It means you can change. It means that you're not stuck. Here's a great quote from Buchanan's book, which is our focus focus book for this series. He says this, Repentance means what has been does not control what will be. Your past need not derange, deform, or hold ransom your future. It means that the difference between brokenness and wholeness, dirtiness and cleanness, folly and wisdom is one door, the door of repentance. 
Now, of course, you can't repent in your own strength. You can't transform yourself. I'm not suggesting that for one moment. But true, diligent repentance is a fruit of abiding in Christ. What are you sinking your roots into? What are you filling your mind with? How are you using your time? Jesus says in Luke 9, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me. Deny themselves. Underline that word deny. Highlight it in your Bible. Deny yourselves. Because there are things we need to deny ourselves of in order to pursue a deeper abiding in Christ. As we turn from one thing, we don't we, we, we turn actually to Jesus from sin to Christ. There are things, therefore, we need to stop doing, stop engaging in, in order to pursue a holy life. And so any practice, any habit you're drawn to that's in danger of becoming addictive can affect your sense of alignment with the things of God and throw you out of your spiritual rhythm and sink spiritual roots into layers of salinity that will harm, if not destroy, your faith. God wants better for you than that. Social media, Netflix, alcohol, certain foods, certain web searches, these are things not all necessarily bad in themselves but can be barriers to deep abiding. And so maybe you've developed some other habits that you need to repent of. Negativity, a critical spirit, maybe you become cynical or just grumpy. Repent. What's in your soil or lacking in it that might be weakening your roots and choking your fruit? Ask yourself this. Am I deep-rooted in Christ? Am I tenaciously dependent? Am I diligently repentant? Ask the Lord about that. Let's talk to him. Let's, let's do that right now. Lord Jesus, we recognise that truth here in John 15, that apart from you, we can do nothing. We read the truth in Philippians 4 that Paul says, in Christ I can do all things. Nothing is impossible for those who are in Christ. And so Lord, we pray that you would teach us this morning more of what it means to abide in Christ, to abide in you, to rid our lives of those things that are unhelpful, those things we would, in many cases this morning, be sinking our roots into that actually we know are drawing on a salinity that will destroy the tree. Again, Lord, we thank you for those folk here who, through standing, have demonstrated that they've been faithful to you over many, many years. Others, Lord, who've... Um, the circumstances have taken them in different places, but also have walked with you for many, many years. Keep us faithful, Lord. Keep us diligent. Keep us tenacious in our dependence. And teach us, Lord, we pray, what it means to abide in you. We thank you, Lord, that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ, but that you give us that gift of repentance. So even this morning as we're bowed in prayer, I wonder if there are some here this morning who would just want to, just in the privacy of this moment, just say to the Lord, Lord, I, there's something I just want to repent of. Something that I've just become caught up in that I know is not right. Something I'm sinking my roots into. I know it's not healthy or helpful. I'm embarrassed. But Lord, here and now, Lord, with your help, I want to turn from that thing. I want to repent of it. And I want to turn towards you and learn more of what it means to walk in step with your spirit. Teach me, Lord, the unforced rhythms of your grace. Help me, strengthen me, that I might walk with you 
in a life of deeper rootedness and greater holiness. Help me, Lord, I pray. Lord, thank you that you hear us as we pray. We thank you that you empower us by your Holy Spirit, that you walk with us for these things. We are deeply thankful. And we give thanks in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand together as we close our service this morning. Jesus, oh Christ be praised. 
thank you, Jesus, for who you are and for what it is that you have done. And we thank you, Father, that in the midst of our ongoing brokenness, that the option for us is to step into grace, to step into love and into forgiveness, not to step away, not to hide and cower in shame, but actually to step in to the new mercies of God, which are new every day. Thank you, Jesus. That is only a reality because of who you are, because of what it is that you have done on our behalf. And so our hope is not in our ability to get it right. It's not in our own personal righteousness. Our hope is in Jesus. And in the righteousness of Christ has been gifted to us by grace through faith. Thank you, Jesus, for that unshakable hope. Thank you, Jesus. This we pray for in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, such a blessing to have you guys with us here this morning. Next week, Graham Mabry is going to continue on in our series with the title Sustaining. A couple other things. We've got Dan Patterson coming in a couple of weeks, which is very exciting for us. So he's going to be speaking here on Sunday morning, the 6th of August. He's got a whole week of ministry on the Thursday and Friday. He's doing a master class for school here at church. Friday night, he's going to be speaking at Youth Q and an event for our youth kids, which is going to be fantastic. Sunday morning here. And then Sunday night, he's going to be here again for a Q&A. So we're going to put a Slido out, which is a code that people can text questions in. That's going to be open the entire week. And then we're going to curate those questions together for the Q&A that Sunday night. So I highly, highly recommend that you be there for that. Dan Patterson is just uh, an amazing speaker, brings some real wisdom, a real gospel heart, an ability to connect with our culture and speak into the issues that our young people in particular, but all of us are facing at this time. And so I really encourage you to make the most of that. Come check out Dan Patterson. Today is also the closing of our Indigenous Art Exhibition, which means this is your last chance to check out the exhibition and purchase any art that you may want. And we do encourage you to do that. Be blessed. Have a wonderful, wonderful week. If you need prayer for anything, please come on down or tap the person on the shoulder next to you. But be blessed and have a great week.